Good morning. We're continuing our study in the book of Romans, and we're in the midst of Romans chapter 11. And today we want to focus on verses 13 to 15. But before we do, I think it'll be helpful for us to see how these verses fit into the overall flow of chapter 11. As I've been telling you for the last few weeks, chapter 11 is all about Israel. It's about the Jewish people and what God is doing with them. We already have spent time looking at verses 1 to 10, and in those verses we saw Paul speak about how God has been faithful to the promises that he made through Abraham, the father of Israel, faithful in spite of all of Israel's unfaithfulness. In Genesis 12, 3, God made a promise to Abraham. He told Abraham that through your offspring, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What did that mean? Well, clearly, now looking back in hindsight, we can see that's a reference to Jesus, to the coming of the Messiah, who would reverse the curse of sin. Even though we don't realize it, there is no greater blessing in our lives than that. Health and wealth and prosperity don't begin to compare to the blessing that is ours because through Christ, God has reversed the curse of sin and brought us from death to life. God's promises to Abraham, they haven't failed, even though God's people, Israel, has failed. God has been at work throughout Israel's history, preserving and saving a remnant for himself, all for the purpose of his glory. He preserved a remnant so that the Messiah could come and fulfill the promise he made through Abraham. But he also preserved a remnant after Messiah came, a remnant that was comprised of the disciples and other faithful Jews who embraced the Messiah and founded and organized Christ's church. But as we move on through the rest of chapter 11, Paul's focus begins to change. Rather than speaking merely of a remnant that God is at work saving, Paul begins to speak about the fullness of Israel being saved. That is, it seems like Paul's pointing ahead to a future restoration of the people of Israel. Let me just give you a quick glance of what Paul's going to be pointing us to throughout the rest of chapter 11, because I think that will help us, like I said, put the verses we're looking at today into a proper context. Perhaps the easiest way to do that is to just read you the verses from verse 16 to 26 of Romans 11, and then give you just a brief commentary on what Paul's going to be teaching us. As we do that, then we'll see how the verses we're looking at today fit into that flow. Paul writes in Romans eleven sixteen. If the dough offered as the first fruits is holy, then so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off, and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? 
lest you be wise in your own sight, and do not want I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all of Israel will be saved. This is where Paul is, is headed. Eventually, there will be a restoration of the people of Israel. Branches will be grafted back into the tree again. At present, many have been hardened and they've turned away from God. And as a result, they've been cut off. But one day, the hardness will melt away and restoration will come. Because this illustration Paul's using is so important and so revealing of the truth of what God is at work doing, we're going to spend several weeks on these verses about the olive tree. But for now, let's just get a picture of what Paul's painting for us. In this way, we'll be able to discuss the verses immediately preceding this picture of the olive tree. So what Paul shows us is there's an olive tree. The root of the tree is the promise of God to redeem a people to himself through the Messiah. At first, the tree was just Jews. It was just ethnic Israel. They grew out of all the promises that God made to Abraham. The Messiah came as a result or through those promises. It could be rightly said that the cultivated olive tree was a Jewish tree. But many of those Jewish branches failed to produce fruit. So those unfruitful, unfruitful branches have been pruned off. They've been broken off the tree in Paul's language. And in their place, what's God done? He's grafted in wild olive shoots, the Gentiles. But that's not the end of the story. Look what Paul says in verse 23. God's not done with these natural branches that have been cut off. Just as the wild branches were grafted in, these cultivated branches, even though they've been broken off, can, through God's power, be brought back to life and grafted once again back onto the tree. Again, we're going to really dig into this in the coming weeks, and I encourage you to come back week after week for the exposition of this. But for now, just think of the big picture that Paul's painting for us. There's just one tree. It is rooted in the plan and purposes of God and the promises of God, which are all fulfilled in Christ. That tree is the people of God. You could call it true Israel. You could also call it the church. Both are correct and they're one and the same thing. Growing as part of that tree are natural branches, faithful Jews like Abraham and Moses and David, and by the way, the disciples, well, all except for Judas. These are all people that, even though Christ hadn't come yet, bore the fruit of faith. Old Testament believers of true faith are the natural branches that remain part of the tree. But growing alongside of those natural branches are Gentile branches that God has been grafting in through Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. These are people like the Ethiopian eunuch of Acts chapter 8 that Philip shared the gospel with, or the Roman Cornelius that Peter shared the gospel with in Acts chapter 10, or Lydia and the Philippian jailer that Paul and Silas shared the gospel with in Acts 15. All these people heard the gospel, responded in faith, just as the disciples did. So in this tree, you have faithful Jews, Old Testament. You have faithful Jews, New Testament, the disciples. And you have faithful Gentiles who've been grafted in. But look what else Paul tells us. Alongside those natural Jewish branches and the grafted in Gentile branches, God will once again graft back into the tree some of the broken off branches, restoring them to life in the tree. So in the end, this tree will have many different kinds of branches from all the families of the earth, just as God promised Abraham. In Genesis 12 3 although these branches will come from all the families of the earth they make one tree sharing a common root a common trunk that is Christ Jesus and bearing common fruit that is the fruit of the Spirit 
John 15, 5. Think what Jesus said there. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's all about being joined to the tree by faith, whether you're a Jew looking forward to Christ in the Old Testament, whether you're a Jew after Christ in the New Testament, or whether you're a Gentile who was grafted in. The only way to bear fruit is for all of us to be connected to Christ. Until that happens, we're dead. Being joined to Christ by faith makes us alive and fruitful. If we are grafted into Christ, we will bear fruit. That's Jesus' promise there in John 15, 5. So do you see the big point Paul's making here? A day is coming after the fullness of the Gentiles has been grafted into the tree, brought to faith in Christ, day is coming in which God will once again graft many of fallen Israel back into the tree. And in turn, what will happen, this will make the tree even more fruitful, even more beautiful. This is what Paul was pointing us to. Remember last week in verse 12, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentile, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Because Israel stumbled, a way was made for the Gentiles to be grafted in. That meant spiritual riches for the Gentiles. But how much greater will those riches be when God performs another miracle and grafts back in fallen Israel to the tree? That's what's going to happen one day. And understanding that, at least in a big picture sense, it sets the stage for what Paul writes in verses 13 to 15 of Romans 11, the verses we want to consider today. Listen to what Paul writes there, Romans eleven thirteen 13 to 15. Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Now, as I read those verses, questions come to my mind. Questions that I'd like to work through in the rest of our time together this morning. First question, what does Paul mean when he says, I magnify my ministry? Second question, why does Paul magnify his ministry? And, and third, what's the result of Paul magnifying his ministry? Now, as we get ready to answer those questions, look at how Paul begins this section of verses. He makes it clear he's addressing the Gentiles, although if you've been reading through the book with us, it should be clear by now that he's been addressing the Gentiles all along. Whenever he speaks about the Jews, he doesn't do it in the second person using pronouns like you or yours as if he were speaking to them. He does it in the third person using pronouns like they, speaking about them to somebody else. For example, Romans 9 verses 4 and 5. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Notice what Paul does there. He doesn't say you, to you belong these things. He says to them. Even though Paul was a devout Jew, he was called and commissioned by Christ with a specific purpose to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Listen to Paul's own testimony of his commissioning by Christ in Acts 22, 17. When I had returned to Jerusalem and I was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him say to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And he said to me, go for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. From that moment forward, Paul lived and ministered under that commissioning. Oh, he preached to the Jews, but his primary emphasis in his ministry, his primary mission work was to go into Gentile territory and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Look what he says in Ephesians 3, 7 to 9. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given 
to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone that is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God who created all things. As the apostle to the Gentiles, this is what Paul's doing to the church in Rome. He's bringing to light this mystery of the gospel. Paul had a hand in planting many churches in the Roman Empire, but interestingly enough, the church in Rome wasn't one of them. Paul didn't plant that church. In fact, Paul makes it clear later in the book of Romans in chapter 15 that he's never even been to Rome yet as he wrote this letter to the church in Rome. How did the church get there? It was undoubtedly planted by Jewish Christians who had gone to Rome after they had been in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost and heard Peter preach the gospel message. At its inception, this church in Rome would have been like the church in Jerusalem, made up only of Jews who embraced Christ. But in AD 49, a Roman emperor by the name of Claudius expelled all the Jews, Christians and just Jews, Jewish Christians and non-Christian Jews, for rioting over the word Christus. Likely, that was a Latinized form of Christos, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. So Claudius got tired of hearing the Jews argue, the Christian Jews and the non-Christian Jews arguing about Christ. Luke refers to this decree in Acts 18, verses 2 to 4. There Luke tells us that soon after arriving in the town of Corinth, Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla, Jewish tent makers who have been forced to leave Rome by Claudius. This expulsion of believers in AD 49, it only affected Jewish members of the congregation, and the result was the church in Rome soon was filled with only Gentile converts. So when Paul wrote this letter to the church in Rome eight years after that expulsion by Claudius, it was A.D. 57. And by then, the church in Rome was primarily Gentile. That raises an interesting question, though, doesn't it? Why, in a letter written to Gentile Christians, does Paul spend so much time writing about the Jews? Think about it. We've been in chapters 9, 10, and 11 for several months now, and they are all about the Jews and what God is doing with them. Why should Gentile believers, why should we care what God's doing with the Jews? Hasn't God written them off? Isn't he done with them? Haven't they been broken off the tree? Wasn't God finished with them? Why is Paul spending so much ink writing about them? Well, the answer's there at the end of verse 13 of Romans 11. I magnify my ministry. What does Paul mean by that? Well, think, what does it mean to magnify something? It means to make it larger. In our pride, our natural human tendency is to make ourselves larger. Is that what Paul's doing here? He's the apostle to the Gentiles. The Gentiles have been grafted into the tree. They're taken over the tree. They're more Gentile converts than Jewish converts. Is he bragging about how his work with the Gentile Christians has been so much more profitable than the work the disciples were doing with the Jewish Christians? That's one way maybe we could think of magnifying ministry, but it is not the way Paul's thinking of it. Paul's thinking of a better way. Look what Paul's doing here in all of chapter 11, in the verses I read earlier, in the verses we're looking at today. He's doing something we call discipling, teaching, helping these Gentile Christians to grow in their faith. He's not like some modern-day revival preacher who rolls into town and preaches a gospel message and asks people to raise their hand and then records how many got saved like notches on his belt and then rolls out of town to the next town. No, he's engaged, engaged in teaching a deeper understanding of the truths of the gospel that they've already embraced. Paul was intent on doing what Jesus commissioned all of us to do, to go and make disciples, not just converts, but disciples. 
Disciple making isn't just evangelism, it is teaching, it is helping people to grow in their faith. It is moving in beside people and living life alongside of them to help them apply the gospel to their life. That's how you magnify ministry. That's what Paul did with Priscilla and Aquila in Acts 18. Listen to those verses. I referenced them earlier, verses 1 to 3 of Acts 18. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. This is how Paul magnified his ministry and made it larger. He moved in beside people. He discipled them. This is what he's doing with his letter to the Romans. He's not writing it to get them saved. He's writing it to explain to them all that the gospel means for them. Think about it. Theologically, the book of Romans is inarguably the most dense and, and complete, complex book of the New Testament explaining what the gospel is all about. Paul wrote it to a Gentile church in a city he had never visited. Why? To disciple them, to train them, to train them in the truths of the gospel. He probably wrote it because of conversations he had with Priscilla and Aquila as they so tense together. Paul didn't just want the church in Rome to be saved. He wanted them to fully understand the unsearchable riches of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and what those riches meant for their life. So now let's talk about why Paul wants to magnify his ministry to the Gentiles. Paul gives several reasons here in Romans 11. One that we'll see in the coming weeks is a warning for them not to be arrogant, not to be conceited. But part of the answer is here in verse 14. In order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. This is what we talked about last week. Paul's desire is for the Gentile church to flourish in such a way that it produces so much fruit that it arouses the Jews to jealousy. In terms of the tree that Paul's going to talk about later in chapter 11, these Gentiles have been grafted in. Why? For the purpose of bearing that fruit. So Paul wants to do all he can to encourage that fruit in their lives because their fruitfulness will make the Jews and the rest of the world realize what they're missing out on because they've rejected Christ. And God will use that jealousy to stir in their hearts and graft them back into the tree, bringing them to life. Now let's take just a moment and apply this to our lives. Why would anyone be want to be a Christian? Why would anyone want to be a Christian if our life looks just like theirs, if there's no difference? Why have Jesus if Jesus doesn't change anything? If we don't bear fruit, what's the point in being grafted in? There's a saying you may have heard, it goes like this. If you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence in your life to convict you? Peter gives an exhortation along those lines. 1 Peter 2.12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Is that happening in our lives? Does that describe us? Jesus said in John 7.38, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Are we so filled with the living water of Christ and the spirit of Christ, that what's in us is flowing out to the world around us so that they see our good deeds and glorify God, even though they don't want to. So that they see the fruit in our life and become jealous and wish they had in their life what we have in ours. Are we magnifying our ministry to those around us not just telling people they need Jesus, they need to get straightened out in life, but showing them through our lives what a difference it makes to have Jesus in your life. The whole duty of a Christian can be summed up in this, 
feel, think, and act in a way that will make Christ look as great as he really is. Be a telescope for the world to look through and see the infinite starry worth of the glory of the unsearchable riches of Christ. We can't magnify what we haven't seen for ourselves. We can't magnify what we forget. That's why Jesus made that point in John 15, 5 of saying, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Day by day, we must abide in Christ. If we're not bearing fruit, if streams of living water are not flowing from our life, then there's only one reason. It's because we've lost or never had connection with Jesus. Because we will bear fruit. We will have streams of living water coming from our life if we are connected to the source, which is Christ. Do you know when Jesus is most magnified in your life? It's when, by the world's standards, your life stinks. It's when your marriage is struggling. It's when your job's going poorly. It's when your health is unhealthy. It's when your financial position is shaky. It's when your children are unruly. It's when your job is at a dead end. Because the world's going through all of that stuff and they need to see how a Christian handles it differently. The world around you is struggling with all those same things and they're miserable in the struggle. Think of the broken places that are there in your life. How can Christ use them to let the joy of your salvation flood through those broken places and shine out to the world around you? The best way to disciple others isn't to say, look, I have my life all together, be like me, but rather it's to come alongside of them and say, I've got the same brokenness in my life. I'm going through the same thing that you are. Here's how Jesus is bringing joy to my life in the midst of the sorrows, in the midst of the trials and tribulations. Paul knew that. Think of what he said in 2 Corinthians 12. He spoke there about a thorn in his flesh. Actually, the Greek word Paul uses there, our Bible translates as thorn. It means more like a stake that's impaled him. He calls this thorn a messenger from Satan, meaning that Satan's intention with it is to distract him and to keep him from magnifying his ministry. Paul says he pleaded with God three times to remove the stake, but his prayers went unanswered. Instead, listen to the message you heard from God. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is how we magnify ministry. The world needs to see how we handle success, but you know what they need to see even more importantly? <laughs> how we use the grace and power of Christ to deal with the struggles and the trials and the tribulations of this life. When people see how Christ changes the way we live our life in the midst of those struggles, and see the joy coming through the brokenness in our life, it will make them jealous to have Christ in their life. That's what brings life from the dead. DeMar Hamlin, some of you might have been watching the game on Monday Night Football where he collapsed on the field here right at the first of the year. Sudden cardiac arrest for all intents and purposes, he was dead. But he was revived. And listen to what he says. Sudden cardiac arrest was nothing I would have ever chosen to be part of my story. That's because sometimes our own visions are too small, even when we think we're seeing the bigger picture. My vision was about playing in the NFL and being the best player I could be. God's plan was to have a purpose bigger than any game in this world. My entire life, I felt like God was using me to give others hope. Now, with a new set of circumstances, I can only say 
He is doing what he has always done. I have a long journey ahead, a journey full of unknowns and a journey full of milestones. It's a lot easier to face your fears when you know your purpose. As Christians, we know our purpose. It is to magnify Christ. Sometimes we mistakenly think the only way God can magnify ministry in our lives is through success and prosperity. So the world can see God blessing us. But I think it's actually the opposite that more normally is true. God uses the failures, the thorns in the flesh, the life-altering circumstances, not just to wake us up to see his grace in our own lives, but to be a telescope magnifying the ministry of the gospel in our own lives. Don't ever think the brokenness in your life is what's keeping you from magnifying ministry. God often uses our own death to self to bring death to life in others. What does it mean for us when Paul says, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? How do we understand this idea of life from the dead? It would be simple to say that Paul's speaking of a resurrection because certainly, at least in one way, he is. In some ways, this verse points to a resurrection to life that will happen when Jesus comes again and gathers all of his own to be with him forever. What a day that will be. All the tree gathered in. Just stop for a moment and imagine with me the glory stories that we will share in and through all of eternity with each other. Indeed, in the process of that, Jesus will get all the glory, and rightfully so, because our salvation, our resurrection through eternal life, it starts and ends with him. But we get to share in the glory stories, don't we? Christ has commissioned us to go and share the good news of the gospel. He's drawn us into this glory story. He's commissioned us to magnify ministries by using us as a means to disciple others. In doing that, he's bringing us in, making us part of the story. Imagine in eternity a person walking up to you and saying, Jesus saved me because you magnified ministry in my life. You shared Christ with me and you discipled me. Or Jesus saved me because you magnified ministry by discipling this person who discipled that person, who discipled that person, who shared the gospel with me. Think about it. I'm saved because God used a continuous line of people actually going all the way back to Adam and Eve because it was Adam and Eve that told their offspring of the promise in Genesis 3.15 that God would send a redeemer who would crush the head of Satan and make salvation possible and reverse the curse of sin. That promise was repeated from Adam and Eve down through countless generations until it came to me on a summer day in 1964. I am saved because God used a continuous line of people going all the way back to Abraham to magnify ministry in my life. I am saved because countless generations of people were used by God to pass on the promise that through Abraham's offspring, all the families of the earth would be blessed. My family was one of those families. I am saved because the disciples and Paul magnified ministry in my life. I don't know which ones or one it was, but in glory I will. Because that disciple told somebody who told somebody else who told somebody else, and you know how it goes, all the way down to me. There I will see an unbroken line of succession tracing back through generations to the early church, to the disciples, to the prophets, to David, to Abraham, and yes, even to Adam and Eve, proclaiming this gospel story. Do you see what I'm saying? I've been brought from death to life because 60 years ago, a counselor at a summer camp magnified ministry and shared the gospel with me, giving up his summer to be there to do that. But I'm also saved 
because God has moved through all of history. Somebody told that counselor of the gospel, disciple of him, I am saved because God moved through the lives of all of the elect to magnify ministry so that one day I would hear the good news of the gospel, that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. And now in some small way, think of this. God is using me. He's using you to magnify ministry so that others in this generation and in generations to come can know the hope that is ours in Christ. Think of that. Our gracious God. It's not enough he just gives us the grace of Jesus Christ. He also brings us in and graciously allows us to be part of the glory story, using us to make known the unsearchable riches of Christ. But I don't think Paul simply has in mind here that glorious future resurrection that I've been talking about when he speaks of bringing uh, death to life in verse 15. I think Paul's speaking about the riches of the blessings that are ours even in this moment that we're in right now as we share the unsearchable riches of Christ with others. I can't think of anything that brings more joy than being part of someone's life and being able to share the gospel with them and seeing the dead come to life. In Ezekiel 37, there's a wonderful picture of death coming to life. I often use this account to describe what it means that we're dead in our sins. But today, I want to use it for a different purpose. I want to use it to illustrate what it looks like for God to magnify ministry through our lives. Ezekiel 37, 1, Ezekiel writes, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones, and he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. You know, that's not dead, just dead. That's dead, dead. It's what we are in our sins. But then in verse 3, God asks Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin and I will put breath in you and you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesied, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone, and I looked, and there were tendons and flesh that appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breathe breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. How did God bring those dried out dead bones back to life? Through Ezekiel, magnifying ministry, God graciously brought him into the gospel story to show him the power of proclaiming the word of God. God can do the same thing through you and me today. It is what God does. He graciously brings us into the glory story, and gives us a voice, and all we have to do is our part. Magnify ministry. Let Christ be known through our lives. In the context of everything in chapter 11, think what Paul's saying here to the Gentiles who've been grafted in. Don't get all puffed up and proud and write these Jews off who've been broken off. Don't damn them or condemn them because even though it looks like they're dead, I specialize in bringing the dead back to life. It's what God says. It's what God does. He'll take our heart, heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Paul saying, I've magnified my ministry to these people so that God could work through that ministry and bring death back to life. Now you go, you go and do likewise.
You've been grafted into the tree. Don't be arrogant and proud, but rather go and magnify ministry. Go and bear fruit so that others, even the Jews, can be grafted in. Do you believe that God brings life out of death? Your struggling marriage, your troubles with your children, your finances, your job, your health, you know what they all they, they all are an opportunity for you to magnify ministry, to let the glory of Christ shine through your life so that others can be brought from death to life. Can these dry bones live? Only God knows. But this I do know. Jesus has commissioned each of us to go and prophesy to the dry bones, to go and make disciples. Wherever God has put you, whatever situation he's put you in, is an opportunity for you to magnify ministry. Let the light of Christ that's in your life shine out of those broken places of your life into the brokenness of the world around you. Our God is a faithful God. He brings forth life from the dead. And if you don't know that life in your own life, if you see no fruit, if there's no streams of living water bubbling up inside of you, please come and talk to me after the service. You're missing out on so much. But if you've come to know this life that's in Christ, and if it's in you, then go. Go in every circumstance in life and magnify ministry. Be a telescope to let others behold the unsearchable riches of Christ in your life so that they can be raised from death to life. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We ask for your blessing on these words that we just heard. Father, that which I've spoken, which is unfruitful, I pray that it would be forgotten. But that, that which can bear fruit, Father, I pray that you would plant it deep into our souls, that you would bring us to a deeper faith, that we would magnify ministry to the world around us, letting the light of Christ shine through us. And I ask this in Christ's name. Amen.